Hey guys, tonight we're going to talk about differentiating GU disorders or genitourinary disorders. So there's not too many of them, but I'm going to kind of go over and break down some of them in case you're having trouble kind of seeing the difference between them. So let's talk about UTI or a urinary tract infection. So kind of the highlights of UTI is it's an infection in the lower and or the upper urinary tract, inf uh, excuse me, urinary tract system. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and so as a whole, um, you can start with the lower UTI and it can move to your upper. You can just have an upper UTI. It can vary. You can have one or both. Um, but as a whole, it's an infection. Most common bacteria that causes it is E. coli, um, but also if you're at high risk for infection, like you have diabetes or if you have poor hygiene, um, you're also going to be at higher risk for UTI. And females, of course, are at higher risk than males. Um, we're going to get uh, urinalysis and look for nitrates, um, red blood cells, white blood cells, and what's called leukocyte esterase in the urine um, as signs that the patient may have a UTI. And then we're going to get a culture and a sensitivity to see um, what is growing and then what are the most effective antibiotics to treat it. So like I mentioned here, we're going to treat with antibiotics. We're going to start with a broad spectrum, which means one that's going to give general coverage um, overall to um, most UTIs. And then um, after we find out what the bacteria that's actually growing, we can change that if we need to. Um, we're going to encourage thing, um, things like hydration, finishing all antibiotics, proper perineal hygiene, wiping from front to back, um, cranberry juice, and avoiding things that change the pH of your urinary tract, um, like um, douches and other feminine hygiene products. Um, so other things to avoid are going to be bladder irritants, like alcohol, citrus juices, smoking, you know, those kind of things, and also um, douches, feminine hygiene products. And then I also want to avoid constipation because anything that affects the bowels can also affect the bladder as well. Now let's talk about kidney stones or click, uh, calculi or um, anything you see like um, nephrolithiasis. This is all talking about the same thing. These are kidney stones that can be made out of different materials. And it's definitely good to know the basics of, um, you know, what are the, um, some of the most common types. So you know what kind of dietary teaching that you're going to do for each of those. Um, goals are to pass the stone and to manage pain. Um, so this may seem a little counterintuitive because it's like, oh, it seems like there's something else going on because it's a urinary tract problem. But really the big issue is their stone and it's not causing a complete blockage, but it's incredibly painful. Um, and they may have, um, you know, a lot of discomfort with urination, and they also can be in so much pain that they're not hydrating well. So encouraging them to hydrate and ambulate can really help managing a lot of that pain. But most of these patients are going to need narcotics or opioid analgesics in order to manage their pain because it is intense. We need to strain all urine in these patients because we need to see what kind of stone um, is inside so that we can best treat them and counsel them for the further, um, uh, for the future, excuse me, so that they don't continue to have kidney stones. And again, they make diet change based on the type of stone. So the most common type is the calcium oxalate. So remember for those patients, we want them to to um, decrease their intake of sodium. So it's kind of counterintuitive. You think like, oh, it's a calcium stone. They need to have less calcium. Um, but it actually, if you have a low calcium diet, it can put you at risk for these type of stones, the calcium oxalate, because you know what happens is your body is so smart. So if I'm not taking in enough calcium, my bones start breaking it down and saying, hey, you need more calcium? Here's some calcium right here. Um, and so as a whole, um, uh, definitely can start to affect you. Um, even if you're trying to limit your calcium, it can actually make it worse. So the low sodium is what's going to help that patient the most. So let's talk about urinary incontinence versus urinary retention. So urinary incontinence is going without knowing. So urinating without knowing or the inability to get to the restroom in time. Um, and so with incontinence, I worry most about skin because usually if they're peeing on themselves and they can have um, definitely breakdown of their skin and a lot of those kind of issues. So for these patients, I'm going to create a voiding program, protect their skin, um, you know, teach them, um, you know, kegels um, in order to support their overall um, muscle, uh, muscle health. And so in other words, kegels are going to teach them how to strengthen those muscles um, that uh, may, uh, like maybe their sphincter has gotten weak or they don't have a strong sphincter, maybe after childbirth, things like that. So teaching them kegels can definitely improve those. Um, and then medication to support urination as a whole. Um, and there's going to be a different PowerPoint that talks about those medications. Um, but as a whole with incontinence, I just want to try to protect them from that injury and stuff like that and get them on a normal schedule. Um, or if there's anything that's a barrier that's preventing them from getting to the bathroom, I want to try to decrease those barriers. 
There's also urinary retention. This is an inability to release or to let go or to be able to, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, actually um, get urine out. So I'm holding onto urine. And this can be an emergency um, because eventually the bladder can rupture. So, um, you know, my biggest priority is getting that bladder drained. Um, it also can be, um, you know, over time, even if it's not retaining high, high amounts, it also is going to put them at high risk for infection. Um, so my goal, my priority goal is going to be to drain that bladder when needed. I need to do an in and out cath or put a Foley in, whatever the doctor orders, but I cannot let that bladder just hang out with um, full, like to the brim of urine. Regular bladder scanning is going to be key in these patients to kind of make sure that they're not retaining too much. And they may be given medications to relax their muscles in their urinary tract to support effective elimination. Last but not least is BPH. This is a problem um, with an enlarged prostate. And so think obstruction or blockage in these patients. Um, a lot like the urinary retention, they're gonna have difficulty emptying their bladder and urinating, um, which can lead to that urinary retention. So a lot of the, uh, the symptoms they're gonna complain of, they're gonna have hesitancy, intermittency, where they're starting and stopping. Um, they can have nocturia, painful urination, um, what do you call it, um, uh, frequency, things like that as well. Um, the treatment is going to be through medications to shrink the prostate, like we're talking about finasteride. And again, there's going to be a different PowerPoint about urinary medications um, and then medications to relax the prostate muscles like Tim Solison. Um, and they can also have surgery to reduce their prostate size. We talked about the TERP surgery in class. Um, and so overall postoperatively, my goal as the nurse is to know what's going in and out. So I'm going to need to watch that intake and output really closely to make sure whatever's going in. Um, like all that irrigation fluid and everything else is also coming out. Um, catheter care and making managing that those irrigation bags is going to be one of my top priorities. Um, making sure that there's no infection if they're having spasms or other symptoms that I'm monitoring for patency of that catheter. Um, because they can like get clots and stuff like that. So I want to make sure that everything's clear. Um, I'm going to monitor for bleeding because remember one of the biggest side effects of getting that um, TERP procedure. Hold on a sec, let me get a drink. And the biggest side effects of um, getting a TERP procedure is bleeding because they're literally scraping away that prostate tissue. And then um, watching for fluid and electrolyte balances. Remember, they can actually abnormally um, uh, absorb that irrigation fluid and get hyponatremic, which is a, you know, can be a medical emergency because they can actually get brain swelling. Um, so I need to monitor their fluids and electrolytes closely. Again, if I'm monitoring what's going in and out, that's definitely going to help because I really need to make sure I'm getting an accurate amount because whatever I'm putting in with the irrigation fluid should be coming out. They shouldn't be absorbing a lot. Um, and yeah, and just monitoring them closely um, for those kind of complications and supporting effective ur uh, urinary elimination for them. So that is differentiating GU in a basket. I hope this helped. Just keep in mind, this is just the like the real basics. There, I'm sure there's some details that I did not include in here, but if you're having trouble kind of seeing some of the differences between these or breaking these down, this should be a good start to kind of get you thinking about um, these disorders. So hope it helped. See you next time.